All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much to Andrea and Jan and all the volunteers who've uh, been helping this morning to organize this event. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and thank you all for being here so early in the morning. Um, what I had in mind to do today was to talk about specific projects and kind of walk you through a line of thinking that's been shaping some of the work that I've been doing at the Art Gallery uh, related to ideas of place and place-based projects. Um, and of course, Andrew has also thrown me this curveball um, to ask me, asking me to talk about this theme of invest. So I'll try and weave, weave that in as well, um, probably thinking a little bit laterally and um, thinking about investing in place, investing in culture, and the kinds of investments that I make as a curator trying to advance the role of the visual arts and the work of artists in society. Can, is this working okay? Shall I move it a bit closer? A bit closer? Yeah, okay. Okay, well, shout out if you can't. <laughs> um, so I'm going to begin by just saying that I am always a little bit wary or maybe suspicious of using business language um, or the language of capitalism to promote the arts. Um, and so as a curator, I tend to think of the work that I do um, as being a practice of care. And that comes from the etymology of the word to curate, from curare, meaning to care. Traditionally, it's meant caring for objects in, or collections in a museum, but I think that um, that concept is kind of being um, updated to think about how we care for culture and culture in the community. So that's kind of the place that I'm coming from. And so I'm going to speak about this concept of invest much more broadly, assuming that we can consider the arts and culture as having an intrinsic social value. And I think that's kind of um, made apparent in the manifesto that Andrea just um, read out to us. Um, and for me, it's the capacity of the arts to help knit together our social fabric that I'm um, interested in. And that's what motivates me uh, to do the work that I do. Um, so I'm going to speak about some place-based projects, but I have to begin by admitting that I'm quite new to Victoria. I've, uh, I've actually been here for about five years. Um, Victoria is definitely the smallest city that, um, that I've ever lived in, and living on an island is also a different kind of experience, and it takes a bit of getting used to. Um, that said, it's a huge privilege uh, to live on this island. Um, it's a really extraordinary landscape. Um, and so in a sense, I think what I've been doing with my curatorial work at the AGGV is to turn the challenge of moving to a new city and that challenge of kind of disorientation and a kind of um, um, unhomeliness actually um, into an opportunity for creative inquiry and reflection. Um, so my first investment as a curator has been an, an investment in place and in learning about this place, um, thinking about its complex history and geography, its politics, um, thinking about the kinds of voices that uh, are perhaps left out or that we don't hear enough um, of. And I guess that's the kind of foundation that um, has led to the work that I've been doing here. Um, and so um, I'm going to start with one of the first exhibitions that I curated at the AGGV, which was called Point of Contact on Place and the West Coast Imaginary. And it reflected on the history of first contact on the West Coast of Canada on Vancouver Island at a site that the British called Nootka, um, but is properly known as Yukot on the traditional territories of the Malachan and Wichilat peoples. Um, and so this exhibition included Indigenous and non-Indigenous um, artists, as well as historical and contemporary works across a range of media, um, and kind of opened up this theme 
to consider issues of history and representation. So this first image is a print that's in the Art Gallery's collection by the English artist John Weber, who was an artist that was hired by Captain Cook uh, to sail on Cook's third Pacific voyage to discover the Northwest Passage. Um, and his job was to scientifically document the native peoples of the Pacific. And these are some of the earliest examples of ethnographic images um, of native peoples of the Pacific. And the claim that these drawings were scientific tells us a lot about the politics of science, actually. Um, so while these pictures tell us something about indigenous culture at the time, the foreignness of these images can be used in different ways, including ways that serve a colonial agenda. And these prints um, circulated very widely at the time that they were made. So the date is 1784. Um, and they circulated widely through Europe and contributed to how the Pacific was imagined and understood and ultimately colonized by Europeans in the 18th century. Another work in the exhibition was this very important uh, work by Stan Douglas, who is a Vancouver-based um, artist. I, I think many of you will know who Stan is. Um, he'll be representing Canada at the next Venice Biennale. Um, and this is a work from 1996, and it's titled Nootka. And it reflects on the history of colonization on Vancouver Island, where English and Spanish fleets were battling over trade routes in the 18th century. It's, um, it's a very deeply researched work um, and it includes excerpts from the two sea captains diaries and that forms the soundtrack to the piece. Um, it's also a work that explores the materiality of video. Um, so it's also a very technically sophisticated work. Um, it's a piece that had been, um, that continues to be exhibited widely in Canada and around the world. Um, but it was the first time that this work was being shown on Vancouver Island, um, 20 years after it had first been made. So it was sort of very exciting to be able to, to show this piece as part of this exhibition. Um, as a counterpoint to Stan's work, I wanted um, kind of a monumental, if you like, work by an Indigenous artist. I wanted a work that could kind of stand alongside Stan's work and hold the space of the gallery, um, kind of hold the room in a way that was in dialogue with Stan's work and kind of contextualised it. Um, because most of the rest of the Indigenous work in the exhibition... Um, I just got to do this before, okay. before it falls. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so most of the rest of the work in the exhibition were small scale, um, for the most part prints uh, by an older generation of artists, works that had been made for a commercial um, context. Uh, there were some small woven objects um, made by unknown artists, but again for a commercial purpose. So the opportunity to present a work by uh, an emerging artist with a big vision um, was something that I felt was really important to do. So this is a work by a Nuchalnas artist, Yelma Wenstrop, who had just graduated with his MFA from UVic. Um, and the work, um, the work is actually a kind of enigmatic title um, consisting of 11 dashes. But as you can see, it's essentially the model of a longhouse. And you could walk inside the longhouse and see an installation of objects. Um, and they were objects that spoke about loss and the loss of culture, the loss of cultural memory, um, and the museumification of indigenous culture that contributed to this loss. Um, so even though the, the exhibition was kind of loosely historical in the way that I sort of conceived it and started to lay it out, it was really a thematic show that was um, exploring this um, idea of the loss of cultural memory, which is kind of a very difficult subject to address directly, so the content sort of had to be evoked and 
uh, broached in an indirect way. Um, and you get a real sense of this idea from this work that Yama had included inside the longhouse. Um, and it's, the work is just um, a piece of muslin fabric that had been cast over uh, the carved copy of a Nicholas mask. Um, and the artist's talent here, I think, is in his very precise and poetic execution of an artistic idea and his very thoughtful and economical mm -hmm. use of material. And I have to say that this photograph was taken by Andrea, and <laughs> referring back to ghost stories, I guess. Um, and I think the photograph also helps to do, um, really does justice to the work, so it really conveys the concept um, that, that we were trying to um, evoke through the exhibition. And one of the most um, powerful experiences, I think, uh, f for me um, in doing this exhibition was hosting the Mawachat and Mochalat chiefs who came to visit the show. Um, and you can imagine that I was pretty nervous actually <laughs> taking them through an exhibition which in many ways was my creative response to my very limited knowledge of the history of the island. Um, but I was very gratified by how moved they were by the exhibition. And here we are um, looking at a painting by Jock MacDonald which has the title Indian Burial. Um, and they told me how these artworks, which uh, we might consider as being colonial or objectifying indigenous culture, um, for them it documented a lifestyle that was, um, and a history that uh, was disappearing, um, cultural practices that they were, not, they were no longer able to practice. So these paintings had a significance to them because it documented a way of life that was being lost. Um, and then we had morning tea, which was a really lovely way of um, sort of connecting um, across cultures, I think. Um, so I think the point of that exhibition really was um, the, the emotional register at which um, exhibitions can be affecting and in a way where we can begin to find bonds as a society. And for me, this is where the potential of culture really manifests itself. And you begin to see how important culture is in, uh, especially in a society like this, which is so mixed and culturally diverse and with the layers of history that um, accompany that. Um, so in 2018, I uh, built on some of the thinking uh, related to point of contact and I curated this show which had the title Supernatural Art Technolo Technology in the Forest. Um, and I was looking at how the visual arts and photo-based media in particular contributed to a settler understanding of the forest landscape of Vancouver Island. And I was interested in how photography as an art form um, arising out of the Western canon had mediated and shaped um, the settler understanding of the natural landscape. So, so there's a sense in which this pi picturing of the landscape plays a, um, an important role, I think, in kind of unifying how uh, we as settlers um, imagine the concept of British Columbia. Um, so how images shape and affect our relationship to a place. Um, and the title of this exhibition was of course riffing off BC Tourism's Supernatural BC campaign. Um, and so I was interested in that as a kind of um, place for the critique of uh, the imaginary. But I was also thinking about the extent to which the forest shapes our regional identity, um, even though only a very small uh, percentage of old growth forest remains, uh, most, most of it as protected parks uh, and a few small tracts of crown land uh, on unceded indigenous land. Um, and what I learned through the process of presenting this show um, has a lot to do with, surprisingly, actually our lack of visual literacy um, 
ab about the forest. Um, so, that, so that the average person could not really differentiate between old growth forests, new growth forests, tree farms, and the various kinds of ecosystems that are necessary to support the health of forests. But at the same time, the idea of the forest is um, hugely emotive, uh, not just in BC, but across Canada, um, so that it has a kind of symbolic value um, that plays into um, the politics of place and settler identity and so on. So um, it's kind of interesting for me because this process of making exhibitions is then for me a kind of process of learning and thinking about where I am and what's going on here and um, it's also for me a process of thinking with artists um, and it's a, it's a really interesting and enjoyable process. I'm just going to quickly click through um, some of the works by the artists that were included in the show. Um, this first work is by Sandra Semchuk, who's Vancouver-based. She currently has an exhibition uh, which includes some of this work, I think, actually, at the Nanaimo Art Gallery. Uh, this is a work by Dan Siney, who's also Vancouver-based. Um, this is Kelly Richardson, who teaches at UVic, um, and quite an amazing video work uh, that we had installed in the gallery. Um, Trudy Smith, um, who's also local, Victoria-based, and she hand-builds cameras using vintage lenses and thinking about the, um, the significance of the camera obscura. Uh, this is a work by Leela Sudhir, and I'll come back to talk about this work a little bit more uh, in a minute. Um, and this is a work by Ian Wallace. And I was really pleased to be able to show an excerpt from this work, which also speaks back to the title of the exhibition, Supernatural. Um, <laughs> and, but I was really pleased to show this work, um, which is titled Clearquat Protests. It had never been seen on Vancouver Island before, even though it's been on the cover of Canadian Art and a really iconic body of work. Um, we were able to show it 25 years after it was first made. Um, and I was really interested in how this work was being read in Victoria because it's very different to how it's read in Vancouver as kind of conceptual photography. But I found that people here on the island had a very personal connection to these images and could literally see themselves in the work. Um, so that was, that was really um, interesting and I think important to understand because it wasn't just a conceptual work of art, but it was an artwork that represented a set of tensions and a set of values that have shaped the culture uh, of the island in important ways. So at the same time that I was working on um, supernatural. Um, I was also working on this big project with uh, an artist who's Montreal based, um, but she had been working in the Walbrand Forest. Um, this is Leela Sujir. Um, and Leela works in stereoscopic 3D video at very large scale, which is to say IMAX scale. And she went into the Walbrand Forest with an IMAX camera and her film producer, Chris Kreuter. Uh, Chris is the grandson of um, the person that invented IMAX, and IMAX is a Canadian invention. So her camera actually, you can see the camera there, arrived at the art gallery in this massive pallet, seven foot by seven foot pallet. And our poor exhibitions manager, I said, can you just receive this camera that's supposed to arrive? And neither of us knew that it was going to be this huge thing. He's like, what kind of camera is this? <laughs> um, but, but anyway, Leela went in the, into the forest and um, started shooting video in the forest. And she wanted to explore an idea of the forest as a site of healing. Um, and in many ways, she had a, um, a personal and a sort of autobiographical um, um, kind of idea, I guess, that she wanted to explore. 
Um, but in order to make a work that was not just the personal interpretation of an individual artist that was kind of parachuting into the site, the work needed to engage with the politics of place uh, and the politics of the site. And this was something that Leela understood pretty early on and which has now become central to the process of making work in the forest. Um, and so as background and as part of the research, uh, so the, the research creation process, um, Leela and a number of us have actually spent uh, quite a lot of time researching the settler history of the forest. Regan was also, um, Regan who's here from the gallery, was also very involved um, at the first stages of building this project. Um, we ba began looking at the environmental claims and the, envirom the history of the kind of protests that had happened there, the treaty claims, the politics of the forest, and reaching out to various stakeholders, including the Pachita First Nation. And we've been taking um, several years now to build a relationship with the Pachita Band Council and actively seeking their input and advice on the development of this project. So maybe that's a form of investment as well. Um, but just to say, I guess, that one of the big investments that I think I make as a curator, uh, and I would expect that many, most curators do this, um, is to invest in relationship building and not just for the sake of what could be in it for us um, but thinking about what's in it for the people that we're wanting to work with and the communities that we're in um, so th really thinking about meeting the needs or meeting the interests of the communities that we're working with so it's very much to do with a relational investment and thinking about who benefits and how does society benefit. Um, and I'm not sure if in these discussions about, um, about investment there's been discussion about ideas of social profit. Uh, it sort of come and go comes and goes as a kind of trend, I guess. Um, but this is something that, that we've thought about quite a bit in terms of the development of this project. Um, a couple of years into um, building these relationships in Port Renfrew and with the Pachita, uh, Leela was invited uh, by a curator in Toronto to make a work for a screening program of experimental IMAX films. Uh, and in order to make that work, um, she wanted to make sure that she had the consent of the band to shoot in the forest. Um, and then, and she was also working very closely with one of the elders um, from the Petite community to develop her vision. Um, but we also undertook quite a, um, an, I don't, it's sort of a natural process of um, structuring ways of building relationships um, with the community, with the Petite community. So we undertook a number of community screenings, but um, also meetings with the chief and the band manager and the band council. Here you see uh, the chief um, in the back there with uh, one of the elders um, viewing some of the rushes of footage that Lila had taken in the forest. Um, and because it's IMAX 3D, um, there's a kind of novelty aspect of looking at 3D work on a VR headset um, and spending a lot of time in the community actually talking to them about the work and their interpretation of the forest. And I know I've only got two minutes, but <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly um, click through these slides to give you a sense of what this kind of relationship building looks like. Um, at one point we took a group of artists and community members into the Walbram for Forest and did kind of what Leela calls a mini field school um, and Emily is here from the Wilderness Committee and um, the Wilderness Committee took us out into the forest um, and we also hosted a sort of conversation in the forest with one of the elders um, really to think about um, the meaning of the forest from the Pachita perspective, but also to hear um, about uh, what the significance of this place was across different community perspectives. And these are just some images from some of the community screenings um, 
that we've done. We've hosted a community lunch. And I'm just going to finish with these two slides. Um, this is a film still from the work that Leela produced for the IMAX screening. The work is called Aerial, uh, and it basically surveys the landscape of the Walbrand Forest from the perspective of a hummingbird. Um, and there's a really interesting way in which Leela has used this process, her creative process, to, to make space for the Pachita perspective and for them to be able to reclaim their voice and express their connection to the land and to this place um, from which for the last 150 years they've been displaced or estranged from. And so what's happening here is a kind of um, symbolic repatriation of a landscape which has otherwise been colonized by our settler imaginations. Um, and so I think what she's doing is actually a very small move towards unsettling our nationalist imaginary. Um, and so it's a really exciting work and a really exciting process of um, working with artists and investing in this place. <laughs>